Lammies. So I know that this week we are learning all about Ruth and Boaz, and I know Miss Jackie will be talking about that, and I know Miss Celeste will be talking about that. Um, I found this really cool little Bible in our classroom, so I thought I would read the story too. It's always great to hear a story different ways because you can always learn something new. All right, let's find out what happens with Ruth. Unhappy Times. In the time when Israel was ruled by the judges, a man named Elamech lived in Bethlehem with his wife Naomi and their two sons. One year, the harvest was so poor that Elamech could not get enough food for his family. So they decided to leave Israel until the famine was over and go to live in the nearby country of Moab. While they were there, Elamech died. By this time, the two boys were old enough to look after Naomi, and they married Moabite girls. They brought them, and they brought them home too. But not many years later, both sons died. Poor Naomi was left in a foreign land without a husband or family. But her daughters-in-law Orpah and Ruth were good and kind girls, and they comforted Naomi as much as they could. Soon Naomi felt homesick for Bethlehem. She heard that food was plentiful there once again, so she packed up all her belongings into bundles, and the three of them set off for Bethlehem. When they came near to the border with Israel... Naomi stopped. You have been very good to me, she said to Orpah and Ruth. But now it's time for you to go back to your mothers. Both girls hugged and kissed Naomi. We'll come with you, they exclaimed. No, Naomi insisted. I can do nothing to help you or to make you happy. So go back now. Orpah kissed Naomi again, then reluctantly started back the way they had come. She went slowly, turning often to wave, for she loved her mother-in-law. Now, Ruth, Naomi said, you must do the same as Orpah. Please let me come with you, Ruth begged. I want to stay with you. Wherever you go, I will make your own people my people and take your God for my God. Nothing will make me part from you except death. When Naomi saw that Ruth had set her heart on going with her, she said no more. She was happy and comforted to have Ruth's love and companionship just when she needed it the most. Ruth finds work. The townswomen of Bethlehem welcomed Naomi back, but they were sorry to see her so poor and unhappy. In those days, women could not earn a living, and Naomi had no husband or sons to provide for her. But God had given the Israelites special laws so they would help all of those in need. Farmers must allow poor and hungry people to come into their harvest fields and pick up any stray stalks of grain that the reapers had dropped or overlooked. When Naomi and Ruth arrived in Bethlehem, they were harvesting the barley. Let me go and glean barley, Ruth suggested. If I work hard, I can get enough for both of us to eat. Ruth set out early and chose one field where the reapers were working busily. She kept close to them all morning, picking up every stray grain of stock she could see. At midday, Boaz, who owned the land, came to see how the harvest was going. Who is that girl gleaning over there? He asked, pointing to Ruth. She is the foreign girl from Moab, one of the men told him. Naomi's daughter-in-law. Boaz had heard about Ruth, for news travels fast in a small town. He went across to her. Keep near my reapers for the rest of the harvest, he said. I will see that they leave you in peace. When you are thirsty, drink from the water that my men have drawn. Now come and have dinner. You are so kind to me, Ruth said. She wanted to know why. I have heard about your kindness to Naomi, Boaz exclaimed. May God, whom you have learned to trust, keep you safe in his care. Without a word to Ruth, Boaz told his reapers to drop some barley stalks on purpose so that Ruth would have some extra to pick up and take home. Naomi was delighted at Ruth's success. How did you get so much, she asked. I went to the field belonging to a man called Boaz, Ruth told her. He was very kind to me. How good God is, Naomi exclaimed. <clears throat> he guided you there. Boaz is a relative of our family. You'll be safe with him. <clears throat> Happy endings. While Ruth went gleaning each day, Naomi stayed home. She thought hard. The harvest would soon be over. How would they manage then? Soon Naomi had thought of a plan, and one day she said to Ruth, The harvest is all gathered in, and tonight Boaz will be having his harvest supper. Once it is over and he is all alone, you are to go to him. Ask him to protect and care for us because we are members of his family. Although Ruth felt a bit shy, she did exactly as Naomi told her. She knew that in Israel, God's law said that the men in the family were to care for the widows. 
Boaz was delighted that Ruth had come to him for help. He listened carefully to what she had to say and sent her home with a generous present of grain for Naomi. Naomi was satisfied. He is a good man, she said. He won't rest now until he has made plans to help us. Boaz wanted very much to marry Ruth, but there was another even closer relative of Elamaic living in Bethlehem. He must be given first chance to help the two widows. Boaz waited by the town gate until the man came by and asked if he wanted to look after Naomi and Ruth. It would mean buying back land that had once belonged to Elamaic and marrying Ruth, but the man said no. <clears throat> Boaz gladly married Ruth himself and took her back to his own farmhouse. Naomi was as excited as Ruth and Boaz... <clears throat> Naomi was as excited as Ruth and Boaz when their first baby was born. <clears throat> All right, so let's ask some questions about what we learned in that story. <clears throat> who was in the story? So who did we learn about? We learned about a couple of women and a man, actually a couple of men. <clears throat> Stop watching me. Who is in the story? So we learned about a couple people in this story. Some of them were women and some of them were men. Do you guys remember who they were? Can you tell me a little bit about them in the Lamb's Class email? And... How did the story end? What happened to Ruth and Naomi? Did everything work out for them or did it go really bad? Can you guys tell me? I really love that Bible story because it's a great example of how God has a plan. Something in Ruth told her not to leave Naomi, and if she had, it may have not ended as well as it did. Naomi was able to be taken care of, Ruth was able to be taken care of, and find a husband, and be able to have a baby. So it's a really great story about how God has a plan for us, and he sets each step for us to take so that we can get where he wants us to go. All right, um, that was a lot of fun, Lambs. I'll see you next time. <sighs> Mm-hmm. You sound good though. Thank you. You look good too. <sighs> what time did I start working? I think eight. Is it going good? Yeah, we got power going unlimited and you have audio going unlimited. Okay. <clears throat> Keep going as long as you want. Hey there, Lammies. Um, we're going to read a story today. Now, I know it's spring, but Miss Nika couldn't help it because she loves Kipper. I used to watch Kipper when I was a kid. I found him in our classroom, so I thought it'd be fun to read about Kipper's Snowy Day by Mick Inkpen. I have a feeling that is a stage name. It was a new morning, and it was snowing. Huge cotton ball snowflakes were tumbling past Kipper's window. Yes, said Kipper, jumping out of his basket. Yes, yes. He grabbed his scarf and wound it three times around his neck. Yes, yes, yes. Kipper was very positive about snow. How many of you guys were really excited with all of the snowy days we had last week? That was pretty fun. Kipper rushed outside. The snow lay deep and smooth and new, like an empty page waiting to be scribbled on. He made a paw print, and then another, and then another. And then with a whoop, he went charging around and around, crisscrossing this way and that until the garden was full of his tracks. Kipper stopped to catch his breath, letting the swirling snowflakes melt on his tongue. He fell backward into the snow and lay there panting. When he stood up, he found that he had made a perfect kipper-shaped hole. He tried again, and then he tried a different shape and another. I bet Tiger hasn't thought of this, he said, and ran off to find his best friend. Kipper found Tiger at the top of a big hill. He was wrapped up in a fat bundle of silly woolly clothes. Kipper plopped a friendly snowball on top of his head. Hello, said Tiger. Tiger pointed up at the sky. A watery sun was sweeping through the gray clouds. It won't last, he said. It's all going to be gone by tomorrow. 
There's a warm wind coming. Tiger was like that. He knew about things. Also sounds like living here in Reno. But this was not at all what Kipper wanted to hear, so he started throwing snowballs at his friend. Tiger was very easy to hit because he because the silly woolly clothes were wrapped so tightly around him that he could hardly move. And his own snowballs stuck like pom-poms to the silly woolly gloves. I do find it kind of funny that Tiger is wearing all of that, but he has fur. Look at my new game, said Kipper, falling backward into the snow. You get up very carefully, and there you are. And there he was, or at least the shape of him. Tiger stretched out his arms and fell backward with a soft woolly crump. But when he tried to get up, he could not. He was too round. He just lay there waving his arms and legs like a beetle on its back. <clears throat> Tiger heaved himself over onto his tummy, but rolled too far and found himself on his back again. He tried again, and the same thing happened. Snow began to stick in thick lumps to the silly woolly clothes. Crossly, he heaved himself over once more. This time he rolled over twice, three times, four times. Slowly at first, and then a little faster, and then a lot faster, and then very fast indeed, Tiger rolled down the hill. And as he went, the silly woolly clothes picked up more and more snow so that by the time he reached the bottom, he had changed from a small dog into a giant snowball. The giant snowball fell to pieces. Kipper charged down the hill. Are you all right, Tiger, he panted. Tiger pulled off his silly woolly hat. A big grin spread across his face. Again, he said. So that is what they did all day long, taking turns to wear the silly woolly clothes. And by the time the sun began to dip towards the hill, making their shadows long and skinny, Kipper and Tiger had rolled enough snow to the bottom to build a giant snow dog. They watched their shadows lengthen and fade. It'll all be gone by tomorrow, said Tiger. There's a warm wind coming. But for once, Tiger was wrong. The warm wind stayed away, and that night, another snowstorm smoothed out all of Kipper's paw prints, making the garden like a clean, white, empty page once more. And the snow dog stood at the bottom of the big hill, wearing Tiger's silly woolly clothes. For almost three whole weeks, All right, that was a really cute story. And it kind of reminds me of living here because our weather can be super unpredictable. Last week we had a ton of snow and now looking outside, it's pretty sunny. So it can change 